Okay. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Atmospheric Sciences section uh, lectures by our newly elected fellows. Uh, this is a very, very important uh, thing for us and uh, uh, we have, a, I think, uh, 15 talks and we had 18 honorees this time. And let me take this as a slight opportunity to remind you that uh, think of your uh, accomplished fellows for, for uh, uh, fellow nominations. The, the, the idea that you have to be male, bald, with a paunch to be a fellow should be a thing of the past. <laughs> I'm not speaking about me, mind you. <laughs> I'm Peter Webster, the, the uh, president-elect, uh, um, and I sort of take over, I guess, reluctantly on 1st of January. Uh, our first talk is by an old friend of mine, uh, Anthony Delginio, from NASA GIS, and he's taking on uh, a, a problem that has been alone for a long, long time. When I first went to MIT, Chani said to me, read this, and it had the four remaining problems in meteorology, one of which was the parameterization of convection. And my first thought was, my goodness, I'm entering a rotten field, only four questions to answer. I should have, I should have done medicine or something. Anyhow, uh, Anthony, where is he? Uh, we, can, we can't see anything from up here. <laughs> Okay, well, first of all, let me say that uh, I agree completely with Peter's uh, sentiments about the demographics of the uh, fellows, but unfortunately, uh, we're starting today's session with one of those uh, old, bald with a paunch males, so my apologies for that. <laughs> I'd uh, first of all like to thank AGU and the AGU Atmospheric Sciences section for the opportunity to present. Uh, today, and uh, I'd also like to thank the, the large number of people who have collaborated with me over the years whose names are up here and the graduate students who've uh, worked with me over the years uh, who've contributed greatly to uh, whatever success that I have had and some of who have uh, contributed to the work that I'll show today. So as Peter said, uh, this problem of cumulus parameterization has been hanging around for a long time. And uh, you, could, you could say that we must all be pretty dumb since we haven't solved it in, in 40 years or so. And uh, we haven't solved it yet. But I do think actually that the last decade has been a fairly exciting time in cumulus parameterization because we're realizing and starting to pay attention to some things that we hadn't paid enough attention to before. This is a cartoon. Uh, and, and many of you in the audience today that I've already seen are people who've contributed to, to the understanding that's, that's emerging. Uh, I'm a GCM modeler, cumulus parameterization developer, and so mainly what I do is I, I draw from the knowledge that other people gain about how convection really works and try to figure out ways to represent it in uh, GCMs. So uh, this is a cartoon from a, a paper by Mapes et al. a few years back showing basically what they called the three different building blocks of convection. Uh, shallow congestus, that is mid-level top uh, convection that uh, heats the lower troposphere, doesn't rain or rains relatively lightly, let's say. Deep uh, isolated individual deep convective cells that heat the entire troposphere, and then organized, mesoscale organized convection, uh, including clusters of cells and large stratiform rain regions and anvils that produce a very distinct dipole heating structure of upper level heating and lower level cooling. And Mapes et al. argued that, that if you look over the life cycle of convection with time progressing from left to right, that basically you've got all three building blocks existing at the same time but in different proportions with the shallow congestus dominating at the beginning and then a transition from shallow to deep convection so that you'd get individual deep convective cells, and then eventually, at least under the right conditions, you would get those uh, deep convective cells organizing into mesoscale clusters, and they would dominate later in the life cycle. And they also argued that on timescales much longer than the life cycle of an individual cluster, all the way up to interseasonal timescales, you could envision those as being the same type of thing with changes over longer timescales in the relative populations of the three building blocks. You can see over here on the right, this is a composite 
heating profile as a function of MJO phase during Toga core by Kilatis et al. And here time is progressing in the other direction so that uh, we start here with the leading shallow convection and move to the isolated deep convection and then the organized mesoscale convection phase. And you can see this characteristic upward, westward, tiltward, tilted heating profile. And if you de uh, decompose it into first and second baroclinic modes, then you can see the first mode here, which sort of represents the isolated cell phase, and then the second baroclinic mode, which in one phase gives you the shallow convective heating, and in the other phase gives you the organized convection dipole heating. And the problem with GCMs, or in my view, one of the problems with GCMs is that we've spent most of the history of cumulus parameterization worrying about this stuff. Uh, our cumulus parameterizations have mostly represented isolated deep convective cells, sometimes a spectrum of them in which we were supposed to be doing the shallow stuff also, but if you really ask the people who developed cumulus parameterizations over the years, they spent most of their time worrying about getting this stuff right, and this stuff was a second priority, and this stuff was ignored completely. And so perhaps it's no wonder that over the years we've had consistent problems in many areas of climate models that can be traced to how we treat convection. Uh, our cumulus parameterizations have been deterministic. The convective response is tied to the instantaneous forcing, and uh, usually, or often at least, not always, but often based on quasi-equilibrium concepts. There are particular phenomena that we have done poorly, like the Madden-Julian oscillation. Uh, there's a consistent double ITCZ problem in most GCMs, and most GCMs get the diurnal cycle of continental precipitation wrong, and that's just the short list. You can go on and on. And the question is really, if we're using our climate models to predict future regional climate change, a lot of which depends on the convection that you get, can we actually trust these project, uh, projections without solving these problems? So I want to first look at the, the, the first transition in that three building block phase, the transition from shallow to deep convection. And over the last few years, a large body of evidence has begun to emerge that the transition from shallow to deep convection has a lot to do with the humidity in the atmosphere and that GCMs have a tendency to want to trigger deep convection too easily in dry environments. And that can be traced to the assumption that has been made in many cumulus parameterizations that convection is relatively insensitive to environmental humidity, and that comes into parameterizations via the entrainment rate, the rate at which dry air is turbulently entrained or dynamically entrained into a convective cell, and that just doesn't seem to be right now. Uh, I think there's increasing evidence that entrainment rates are larger than we thought that they thought they were, that there is a tighter coupling between convection and environmental humidity, and that can go potentially in two directions. The environmental humidity can affect the convection by entrainment. The convection can affect the environmental humidity via detrainment of air at the, uh, in the upper levels of the cloud and the evaporation of falling rain. Uh, these are statistics from CloudSat Calypso showing uh, convective cloud top types in geoprof LIDAR data as a function of column water vapor from AMSR E. And what you can see is that at, in, in dry environments down here, you get strictly shallow convection with low cloud tops. But then as you get up to intermediate water amounts, you get this fairly sharp transition to deep convection. But in these intermediate places, you get actually a variety of convective cloud tops deep, mid-level, and shallow cloud tops at the same time for the same total amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. And in the moistest atmospheres, you get almost exclusively deep clouds with just a very few mid-level cloud tops. And uh, this, this type of behavior has been seen in precipitation, first reported by Bretherton et al., uh, David Nealon, who's going to be speaking later this morning, has done a, a lot of work on this transition from shallow to deep convection that I believe he'll be telling us about. Here's a similar plot from a surface-based cloud radar deployed during the Amy Dynamo field experiment in the Indian Ocean, where you see basically similar kind of behavior. Uh, below is behavior that's simulated by our single column model in a version of the model in which we have put in an entrainment rate parameterization uh, due to Gregory, in which the entrainment rate varies with the buoyancy of the rising cloud and, and its updraft speed, plus, plus we uh, allow weaker entrainment only after downdrafts exist. And we'll get, I'll get back to that a little bit later. 
And when we put that type of formulation into our single column model and force the single column model just with soundings from Amy Dynamo, and those are raw soundings and they have errors that yet to be corrected, but it's just a little experiment we're trying to, to take a look at, at how the single column model responds. Uh, what we get is a fairly nice looking entrainment rate profile compared to what people have been saying recently is reality, namely strong entrainment in the boundary layer giving way to weaker entrainment as you get to higher altitude. And that seems to be a formula that works well for producing things like intraseasonal variability in the model. And in this version of our parent GCM, this formula for entrainment is successful in producing at least some semblance of the MJO. And when we plot then the statistics of convective cloud top height from the single column model versus column water vapor, it does a decent uh, approximation of the uh, data including this, this interesting intermediate area where for the same column water vapor you get, you get all different heights of convection, which looks like it should be stochastic behavior, but in this case it's just a matter of subtle variations in the details of the temperature and humidity profile in a parameterization that is actually deterministic. I mentioned earlier that the convection-humidity relationship can go two different ways. Here's an example of relative humidity versus rain rate uh, behavior in the tropics. This is from a figure by a paper by Thayer Calder and Randall showing that uh, in this uh, super parameterization CAM, which makes a very nice MJO, they get this very sharp transition from very dry to very humid conditions uh, at high, uh, from going from low to high rain rates, and they argued that that might be a necessary component for getting the MJO. Here is a version of our GCM that does not make an MJO, and it does not have that behavior. You can see it has very relatively dry conditions at very high rain rates, and so maybe uh, that works out well. Here is a version of the uh, GCM that has stronger entrainment, entra entrainment rates that does make a strong MJO, looking at the change in relative humidity uh, between that and the version that does not make an MJO. It makes an MJO without actually making the mid-troposphere wetter at high rain rates. And so in our model, at least, you don't need this contrast in relative humidity to actually get the MJO. Here's a different model in which we've added stronger rain evaporation and a stronger downdraft that does give you an increase in relative humidity. And that looks a lot more than like uh, this one. But it turns out that this one doesn't actually make an MJO that's really any better than this one does. So in our model, at least, the rain evaporation component does not matter. Only the entrainment really seems to matter. And uh, this, this question then of, of what you really need to, to get the MJO and the role of moistening of the atmosphere during the run-up to the uh, disturbed phase of the MJO, there have been suggestions that you need the convection to do the moistening. In our model, we don't need that. Uh, this is a plot of MJO filtered OLR, which is the dashed lines, and low-level moisture convergence, which is the blue and reds as a function of longitude and MJO phase, so sort of a Hubmuller diagram. And you can see the OLR anomaly propagating eastward with time, and you can see low-level moisture convergence on the large scale leading that. And that seems to be, here's what, here's what this is in uh, NCEP and ABHRR data, here's our GCM version that does make an MJO. And you can see that at least qualitatively it has that behavior, although its OLR anomalies are a lot smaller than the observed ones. That seems to be all we need to make an MJO. If we look at our convective moistening drying rates as a function of column water vapor, you can see the transition from moistening from detrainment and rain evaporation in dry atmospheres to drying at uh, high column water vapor amounts. And when we look at the version of the GCM with stronger entrainment, it looks almost identical to this. When we add stronger rain evaporation, we get a little bit more moistening at intermediate rain rates, but not very much. And so, the idea, I think, perhaps that might be relevant to GCMs is not so much that you need shallow convection to moisten the atmosphere, you just need the GCM to make shallow convection and not fire off deep convection that will dry the atmosphere as the large scale is trying to moisten the atmosphere. So it's not so much that the convection is responsible for it, it is that you want the convection to do no harm. That having been said, rain evaporation in a GCM can be a good thing. Uh, here's the mean precip distribution from GPCP data. Here's what our GCM looks like when it does not have an MJO, and it has this characteristic double ITCZ problem that is the bane of virtually all GCMs. When we increase entrainment, that 
starts to go away. When we increase rain evaporation, it completely goes away, at least in this version of the model, which is a model with prescribed SSTs. Whether that will survive coupling to an ocean remains to be seen. But at least in this version of the model, adding rain evaporation is a good thing for another of the chronic GCM problems. Finally, the, the second transition from isolated convection to organized convection. These are trim profiles, retrievals of convective heating as a function of column water vapor. And this is what the total heating looks like, and this is what the partitioning into the convective component and the stratiform component look like. Here's the GCM's version of that. And the GCM gets a, heating pro, a total heating profile that's not all that much different, except that there are differences in the boundary layer, part of which may be our problem, part of which may be the retrievals. But the big difference is that the GCM does not get the stratiform component at all because we don't have a representation of organized convection. Instead, what we do is we make up for not having that by having a convective component that goes too high. And so that's a, a problem for us. Uh, these are cloud resolving model simulations of convective development over the Darwin, Australia region uh, over the course of the afternoon with rain rate at two hour intervals shown here and surface temperature at the same two hour interval shown there. And you can see that the convection initially develops as isolated cells and gradually merges into larger uh, regions of convection with a characteristic pattern that is accompanied by injections of cold air into the boundary layer from downdrafts that make cold pools. Those cold pools spread out and form a large organized area. And when you look at the boundary layer updrafts that are associated with those things, you can see that the strong updrafts occur primarily at the edges of those cold pools, at the gust front where you've got convergence going on, and particularly where individual cold pools merge. And that seems to be the type of thing that's regenerating convection that seems to be an important part of organizing things. And so uh, that's, that's where we, I think we need to go next in GCMs is reproducing that whole process. And it's a multi-step process involving creating downdrafts and cold pools, regenerating convection, and then producing mesoscale upward and downward motions. We've started on that process by putting a cold pool parameterization into the GCM. And these are our first results with that, showing how, where we get cold pools, how deep they are, uh, how cold they are, and how dry they are compared to the surrounding air. And qualitatively, they look OK. The heights aren't too bad. They're, on average, a kilometer to a kilometer and a half or so. They have a couple of, de they're a couple of degrees colder than the environment, about a gram per kilogram. Uh, drier than the environment, but it, they seem to not be cold enough, not have enough of a contrast with the environment to really have a significant influence on the regeneration of convection. So it's a work in progress that we're uh, looking to, to do better on, and, and I think it's a, a, the final frontier that we really have to address. So that's where we uh, stand now, and uh, I think I'll just leave these conclusions up there and uh, take any questions if there's any time left. Thank you, Tony. Um, I, I guess Chani should feel a little better. Uh, one of his problems is being solved. And any questions, please? It's very hard for us to see, so you have to wave your arm up and down. I, I, I do have one question. Um, I, I wonder if the model is really doing better with the uh, MJO than um, uh, you might seem, because I, I think that the, the uh, Hendon um, uh, uh, phase thing tends to mask the great variability of, of, of MGOs that exist in about half the things that stay right there in the Indian Ocean and just dissipate and slowly dissipate. And I wonder if you've ever looked at the variability of your MGOs in your model. So we, we have not yet to this point, but we are, as many models are, participating in the Yahtzee vertical structure and diabatic heating of the MJO project that's going on right now. And so we've done 20-year climatological runs. Actually, Daehyun Kim, who works with us uh, from Columbia, uh, who was receiving the Holton Award from you uh, at this meeting, has done 20-year runs with our model climatological runs, and then a series of 20-day hindcasts and 48-hour hindcasts during two MJO events during the year of tropical convection. And we're actually going to be able to, to look at those very types of questions. Thank you. Time for one more question? Well, let's thank Tony then. Thank you. Thank you. Next paper is by uh, uh, Neil Donahue from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, uh, an intriguing title, A Lunatic is in the Grass, 
It makes me think the snake is in the grass, or I just finished reading a book called The Lunatic and the Professor. So <laughs> um, I'm, this is about, I guess, aerosols. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Are we on time here? Let's see. All right. Well, thank you. So I, I have a ponytail, and I'm an avid cyclist, so I don't have much of a paunch. But I don't think that settles any real problems here. So uh, I don't think we're making much progress. I want to start by saying, by the way, it's it's I'm the warm-up act for a for a group of atmospheric chemists that I'm truly impressed by. So it's a it's a great honor to be. Uh, to get the opportunity to sort of get things going, and then the interesting stuff will come on in a little bit. Uh, but this this is a really represents a, 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 an enormous amount of collaboration. Uh, the, the newest stuff I'll be showing has to do with a cloud consortium, and Ziggy Schobesberger, Doug Worsnap, Wurs Baltensberger uh, are key components of a lot of the other things. I really owe a lot to Albert Presto, who's in the audience, Alan Robinson, who fractured his arm the other day, uh, so who isn't here. Uh, and, and many, many others at Carnegie Mellon, Spiros Pandas, and the rest of our fantastic crew. So first of all, the, the, uh, the actual grass, as far as I understand it, from, uh, from brain damage from, from the dark side of the moon is at King's College. Um, but that's got nothing to do with this talk. So the, the grass I'm referring to is that when we look at organic aerosol in the atmosphere using mass spectrometers, uh, and, and I'm referring largely here to the mass spectrometers that come from Doug Worsnop's work at Aerodyne, so the aerosol mass spectrometer and variants of it. Uh, even though the organics constitute about half of the material on most particles, uh, the, the inorganic fraction, so this is a mass spectrum, a couple of mass spectra, using one of, one of Doug's latest toys that he calls an APITOF, or an atmospheric pressure interface time of flight mass spectrometer. So it's a very high resolution mass spectrometer that just sucks ambient ions uh, in through a, through a quadrupole focusing uh, uh, interface and then and then gets high resolution spectra of those ions. Uh, this is the char mass to charge ratio from 100 to uh, 600 here on the x-axis, and then signal on the y-axis. And we use characteristic coloring in the in the AMS world, where organics tend to be green and inorganic compounds tend to have other colors. And as a consequence, because when you look at these spectra, you see signal at almost all mass to charge ratios at very low levels often, and they're green, they're organic compounds, whereas the inorganics have very high signals. And that's the grass, the fact that we see the, uh, the, the signal in so many different places. Uh, and and the, the point of the title, and really the point of this talk, is that, that there's two sort of uh, competing aspects to that. One is there's just a lot of signal. From the point of view of an analytical chemist, the signal from this organic material is spread over an enormous range, and it makes the problem difficult. You really want to add up all that material to get some sense of the total contribution. But on the other hand, uh, and this is really important, the reason there's the grass there is that there's a huge array of different molecules, and that complexity, the different molecules, have a really fundamental contribution to the way the problem behaves. Uh, and if I've timed it right, I hope I, I get a chance to convince you of that today. Uh, so that's the idea, and this summarizes that if you just take one of these chunks, that this, the, the red is, is, uh, is sulfate in this case in the AMS scheme. And you have all these little bits here, and if you actually add them all up, they, they are half or so of the total signal. Uh, but the bits matter. Okay, that's, that's it. You can kind of go on. So as, the, the issue that we face is, as a chemist, I want to be able to represent the behavior of those bits and the chemistry of those bits in a, in a manner that respects the actual molecular behavior of all of those molecules. But there's tens or hundreds of thousands of different molecules involved. Um, as a chemical engineer, which is part of my, my uh, title at this point, I want to be able to represent the behavior of that material in a much more simplified way. Uh, both just to make it a comprehensible problem and also so that we can put parameterizations of that behavior in large-scale models that don't have the time or computer cycles to deal with all of that complexity, plus which we just don't understand it. And so in the case of organic aerosol, the first issue we have to represent is whether this material actually wants to be in the condensed phase or the vapor phase. Uh, and so we developed this thing called a volatility basis set that takes those hundreds of thousands of molecules or so uh, and, and spreads them uh, in, in decades of vapor pressure, in decades of volatility. And so with 15 
uh, pseudo compounds or 15 bins of stuff, I can re represent 15 orders of magnitude in vapor pressure and describe the phase partitioning of that mixture. And so that's where we really started in on this problem and this figure just represents that. Very simple uh, saturation equations represent the fraction of material that shows up in either phase. Uh, you can iteratively solve the equation to get the total amount of material in the condensed phase, and this just represents that where the green bars show the height, uh, the height of the green bars, the fraction of the stuff in the condensed phase. It's green again, of course. And typical ambient conditions have somewhere between one and maybe 100 micrograms per cubic meter of organic aerosol. Hundreds a lot. You find that in Beijing. One is typical of the background atmosphere. And so this stuff over here will be in the condensed phase. And even that trivial insight actually leads to some more fundamental things uh, in, in, in the work with Alan Robinson here. We can go and now take what we know about emissions of material into the atmosphere, uh, and this is from a thing called the National Emissions Inventory, and we can bin it up. We can, we can put all those compounds that have been identified and use some other inference on, on volatility of things. And this shows the emissions in the, in, as a percentage of the total emissions uh, in the continental United States in this volatility space. In this case, the green bars represent emissions of biogenic material, and the blue bars represent emissions of, of anthropogenic material. And as a general rule, biogenic emissions, things from trees uh, are emitted more or less at room temperature, and so the compounds that come out of trees and, and, and leaves and, and, and everything else are relatively volatile. Uh, we, we, tend, we like to burn things, uh, and so we generate a little more heat when we, when we cause organics to go in the gas phase. And so anthropogenic emissions, uh, if you go down to low volatility, wind up overwhelming biogenic emissions. So these are monoterpenes. That's isoprene. Those are monoterpenes there. These are sesquiterpenes with 15 carbons here. And then this tail is the burning emissions. The thing is that the tail, I had to blow it up here because you can't really see anything uh, if you look uh, on, on this axis, other than it's a, it's a lot, of, lot of small numbers. And, and the, the point of the previous figure is you have to be way over here to be in the condensed phase uh, under ambient conditions. And so right away, there was an issue that, that, uh, that models used to represent a lot of the emissions from uh, wood smoke and, uh, and uh, diesel combustion, internal combustion engines, as essentially non-volatile compounds. Uh, and in fact, those emissions are over here. And when they get diluted down to ambient conditions, uh, almost all the material actually evaporates and then participates in gas phase chemistry, which is cool because I like gas phase chemistry. Uh, but almost none of that material is actually low enough vapor pressure to stay in the condensed phase under ambient conditions. Now, the problem where we actually started thinking about this was in Albert Presto's thesis where we were looking at the oxidation of a monoterpene, alpha-pinene, when it reacts with ozone because it's unsaturated to make what was called secondary organic aerosol, still is. Uh, and actually, it had been understood for quite some time that most of the secondary organic aerosol was a semi-volatile uh, mixture from the work in John Seinfeld's group. And so this is a representation of the distribution of products from the alpha-pinene ozone reaction in this volatility space uh, where the green bins, again, are what's in the condensed phase at an organic aerosol concentration of 50, 60 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, and then these dots are, are known species. The issue with alpha-pinene plus ozone is there's, I don't know, two, three, four hundred different molecules that get produced from the reaction. So again, the complexity is huge. But some of the key species are things like pinonaldehyde, cispinonic acid, pinic acid, uh, and even here, so pinonaldehyde is completely in the gas phase. Uh, cispinonic acid, I mean, you can, it's a little bit of wax, and you can stick it on a laboratory bench and wait for a long, long time and stare at it, and it doesn't look very volatile. It's wax, but actually under ambient conditions, almost all the cispinonic acid winds up being in the gas phase, and we've been able to show that. Uh, and so then the, the next reason we're very interested in gas phase chemistry is the behavior of this stuff in the second generation. So it's the oxidation of this material that's especially interesting to us. And, and that begins to, you know, the, the fact that we're just representing things as vapor pressure at the moment starts to fall apart, and we needed to be able to represent something about chemistry, something about the oxidation of the material. Uh, and so working with Jesse Kroll uh, and others, we started to focus on the, the oxygen to carbon ratio or the mean oxidation state of the carbon as a second axis to represent this material. And this is actually the same process just represented now in this two-dimensional space where here's alpha pinene, here's the oxidation products, the same dots here, uh, and, and, and this, this, these contours are the range of, 
of, of the known products and the, with, a, with a mass balance, a carbon balance put in. And these, these lines represent the, the sort of effect of different chemistries on this, this precursor backbone if you don't break up the carbon backbone. And it basically makes sense. One issue is that when you go out into the atmosphere and actually sample all that grass, there's a lot of oxygen on the compounds that are seen in the atmosphere. Uh, the, the, the jargon in our trade is OOA, or oxidized organic aerosol, first identified by Chi Zhang actually in Pittsburgh uh, about 12 years ago now. Uh, and it's way over here. It's, it's not very volatile at all, and it's very, very highly oxidized. And so we realized this first generation of chemistry didn't get us far enough. Uh, and now there are many processes that can get you there. And in the, in the succeeding talks, you'll hear more about multi-phase chemistry that can get you there. But we've been focusing on the contribution of gas phase chemistry. Uh, because one thing we know is these vapors are in the atmosphere, and they are going to react. So I used to be a kineticist. Uh, and I can use a lot of, I'm also kind of an imaginative guy. Because the kinetic data we have for OH reactions kind of lives down here. Uh, but I took what, what Roger Atkinson and others have compiled, and you just have to believe me that I can make some kind of guess about the rate constant for things reacting with OH. Uh, the good news is I only have to be accurate to maybe within a factor of three, and it's something of a contribution. So we do need a lot of kinetics up here. But this, this figure here shows the gas phase lifetime of this stuff uh, in hours, uh, sorry, in days against reaction with OH. And this is two-tenths of a day here. Uh, and so this material has an extremely short lifetime reacting with OH. The reason that lifetime goes back up here is these things can hide in the condensed phase and there's a mass transfer problem. The reactivity becomes diffusion limited to uptake of OH on the particles in heterogeneous chemistry and the time scale of that is maybe two, three days instead of two tenths of a day. So the minimum in lifetime is these is semi-volatile vapors here and that's why we focus on them. So we went off to a bunch of chambers um, and, and to bring in Urs Baltensberger here, these are data uh, from, a, from a campaign we called Muchachas, Multiple Chamber Chemical, chemical Aerosol Aging Study. Uh, and what we did is we made this traditional secondary organic aerosol from alpha pinene plus ozone. Here are those products, cispononic acid, pinic acid. And then we, we did that in the dark, and then we turned on an OH source, and we did see a significant bump in the total, this is the total concentration of condensed phase aerosol here. And we also saw emergence of products like this triacid, a very highly functionalized, very, very uh, highly oxidized, very low volatility product that contributed to that and, and are, were able to establish conclusively that this stuff was being generated in the condensed phase. Then the question becomes, okay, what happened, does this have any unique properties? And one of the issues that we'll also hear more about later today is the production of aerosol. We're extremely interested in the problem of nucleation of new particles in the atmosphere and their subsequent growth from clusters of a nanometer or smaller uh, all the way up to about 100 nanometers in size where they have enough solute to become active cloud condensation nuclei. So that's one of the big active questions in our field. And we're interested in the, in the extent to which these organics can play in that. Uh, and I'm quite sure you'll hear more from Rennie Zhang about that as well uh, later. So, so our interest has been whether this complexity of organics that can pr get produced in this chemistry can have a significant effect here. Uh, and this is a schematic representing the way that could work in this, in this volatility space here, right? So we have these vapors. They're going to be reacting with OH. And this is a distribution of phase partitioning under a condition of very, very low concentrations of organic aerosol, such as you might find in a place like, oh, I don't know, Hutiala, uh, in the middle of, uh, of Finland, where the, the longest record of nucleation data exists from Marco Kulmala's group. Um, actually dating since the Chernobyl uh, incident when they started measuring aerosol properties. And so if we oxidize this material, we can produce things that, that we can drop vapor pressure by three, four, five orders of magnitude in one step of oxidation with OH radical. And these arrows represent the, the sort of directionality of the phase partitioning. The idea is what we're doing is we're generating supersaturation of material. So if we make things a very low vapor pressure here, but just a little bit, these organics over here are going to start to partition to the condensed phase at very, very low concentrations because they have exceptionally low vapor pressures. These things here, especially because of curvature effects, Kelvin terms, are going to want to be semi-volatile. But the idea is this complexity can play a role. Uh, Kuhlmuller calls this micro Kuhler theory. But the idea is that you can put a little bit of this really low volatility stuff down. And then Raoult's law begins to take effect. And the, and the more, I mean, these aren't very volatile things here. These are vapor pressures of 10 to the minus 8 tor and stuff like that. But they can start to play in the chemistry. And so we put that into a model, Jeff Pierce did. These are data of, this is size versus time. We call these banana plots from Hutiala. 
uh, and, and so this is, a, this is a new particle formation and growth event. And that sort of distribution in a, in, a, in a box model of this phase partitioning reasonably represents the growth of these particles. It looks like it underpredicts it a little bit. We get the basic idea going. And so then in the last uh, couple of minutes here, we're going to go to Geneva, where there's this wonderful experiment called Cloud. Uh, it uses the pion beam of the accelerator that feeds the accelerator that feeds the Large Hadron Collider uh, to mimic galactic cosmic rays and look for any effect that has on the nucleation rate. Jasper Kirkby is the principal investigator. He's right there, which means the pion beam is not on. Uh, but there, you know, this is the chamber. It's as clean as 25 cubic meters on the planet, quite literally, because the concentrations are kept incredibly low, which is very important to the success of this experiment. So, yep. So we took the uh, a, a, a model of this first generation products of alpha pinene. It was called pinene diol. It doesn't really matter what it what it is, and SO2, and oxidized them with SO2 uh, with OH in this chamber. And using this Apitoff instrument again, but looking at these spectra in a thing called a mass defect space, where this is a fraction of an atomic mass unit here on the y-axis. These are clusters of sulfuric acid, HSO4 minus with sulfuric acid. And we saw the production of these bands of organic compounds that are clustered with different amounts of sulfuric acid. And it turns out that those bands can be described, they're basically what we would call a Van Crevelin plot in the mass spectrometer community, where we're looking at organic compounds with 10 carbons and 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 oxygens, and then 16, 14, 12 hydrogens on those things. And we can see them. Uh, and those are these, this complexity of organic products that are clustering with those, uh, the, with those molecules. So as the chemistry proceeds, we, we see them evolve in this very, very characteristic way that is consistent with that hypothesis. So this, I, I like to close with a cartoon because this is the picture that this, these clusters of sulfuric acid with very highly oxidized organic compounds pave the way, and then we can kind of build up to molecular clusters of three to 10 nanometers, and then finally particles. So thanks very much for your attention. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one day you will be gray. <laughs> uh, um, I, 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 I'm not the person to chair this session, so I hope the questions. I'm a, uh, a dynamicist who thought when my colleagues talk about isoprene, they were talking about Baskin and Robbins. That really is a joke. It's a good joke. Ah. So do I have any questions, please? Well, thank you very much. Our next paper is on uh, multifunctional organic nitrates uh, from uh, 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 Ronald Cohen from uh, UC Berkeley. Okay, so it's a, a real pleasure to be here <clears throat> and to be sandwiched between Neil and John. Um, so I, it was hard to figure out exactly what to talk about. There's so many fun things that we're doing. Uh, so I'll tell you a couple things that uh, I find exciting that we're working on. There, we'll have a poster Friday about a project where we're trying to look at urban emissions of CO2. And uh, if you look on that image on the left, we're trying to put a CO2 sensor down at, on a two-kilometer grid. And so that's uh, a grid of points. The, the colored symbols are places where we have sensors on the other side of the bay from where we are now. And then a, a proposed sensor at, will be at the San Francisco Exploratorium. So next year when you come here, you'll be able to see our walk down and see our sensor at the pier uh, and a museum exhibit. Uh, on Monday, I had a chance to talk about our uh, work with satellite remote sensing of NO2, uh, so I won't do that. And we've also been doing a lot of thinking about evaporation and condensation as they relate to cloud formation. Uh, but So what I thought I would talk about was a, a theme that's uh, been a, at the core of my research group for the last decade, which is really trying to understand the consequences of this simple branching reaction in the hydrocarbon oxidation chain. So when you oxidize an organic molecule, as Neil was just telling us, you, you make most of the time some sort of uh, multifunctional product. 
And typically, we think of those multifunctional products, as Neil just showed you, as acids or alcohols or aldehydes. And a little bit of the time, when the organic peroxy radical that's in that chain reacts with NO, propagating that chain, we have a branch that makes a stable nitrate. And so the question we've been asking is, how many of those stable nitrates are out there? What, what consequences do they have for the chemistry on local and global scales? Uh, I've been uh, incredibly lucky to work with some, uh, a series of really fabulous people on this project. So it started with my crop of first graduate students, and Doug Day took that, put this project on. And then you, uh, you see the other suite here. Uh, many of them are probably here in the room. And now that I'm up here, I can't see either. Um, and uh, it's really been a, a tremendous luxury to work with such fabulous people. Uh, and we've done it from all different kinds of platforms. So we've worked at towers. The tower you see there is a tower in, um, at, uh, in ba near Bakersfield. We've worked on the NASA DC-8. Uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about the Sacramento urban plume because it was a place where, as a chemist, I could understand the meteorology. The Sacramento urban plume is essentially a flow reactor. The winds go up the hill from the city every day, and they turn back around and come back down at night. And so I can ignore the meteorology, more or less. Is, um, so what are these molecules? We know a lot about these molecules from the laboratory, at least the straightforward ones. So if you oxidize an alkane, you make a nitrate that branching between continuing the hydrocarbon chain reaction or terminating it by making a nitrate at these percentages. So if it's ethane, it's of order half a percent. If it's propane, you're up to three. You get all the way up to a C6 alkane, and you're at 20%. You keep going, and it ends at about a third. This is at room temperature. And if you run the alkenes, it's about half that rate, branch. Uh, but those molecules are not normally the molecules that are important in urban atmospheric chemistry, for example. None of those are the biological molecules Neil was just telling you about. Uh, and just as in the organic aerosol world where there's hundreds of compounds, we actually expect the same kind of thing, dozens or hundreds of organic nitrates. Uh, and very, very few of those have been synthesized or studied in the, specifically in the atmosphere. Uh, and it's because the analytical chemistry is really difficult. So here's an example uh, of a group that did try and do uh, specific chromatography on dozens and dozens of molecules. Uh, they added these all up in a marine area and got essentially zero. Um, they did it over the continent in Germany. Uh, an interesting point is that for, if you're oxidizing alkenes, you expect the main products to be hydroxy nitrates. Uh, they were only able, in this study, to see seven hydroxy nitrates, but they had 10 times more than over the marine layer, 20 parts per trillion. Uh, and they had a bunch of uncalibrated hydroxy nitrates, and that's, that got them up higher. That doubled the number. Uh, it was about a half a percent of the uh, inorganic nitrogen. Um, so we set out, and what we set out to do was build an instrument that would allow us to see the sum of all these molecules and not worry about their individual names. Uh, and so that started with building an instrument that could detect NO2 really well. And we do that by laser-induced fluorescence. And then we said, well, what we're going to do is take advantage of the fact that the RONO2 bond has a characteristic strength. And if we flash heat the sample, we'll break the ONO2 bond to give up NO2, and then we'll measure the NO2. And this turns out to work beautifully. Here's an example. This is actually field data, not lab data, where we scan the temperature of an inlet. And you can see that at a characteristic temperature, uh, the, a bond breaks and gives up NO2 to, so that we're measuring on top of the ambient NO2, which at this location was essentially constant, we're measuring some other molecule. And in blue, you see the peroxy nitrates in red, the molecules we're talking about today, the organic alkyl nitrate-like molecules, and then in green, the nitric acid. Um, and so here's a just, you know, it was fun to go back and look at the first times we did this. So the first thing we did was to go out and make measurements, and we made crazy high measurements. So we said, okay, we better do this for a while and see what the variability is like. So uh, Doug Day, in a heroic effort, drove from Berkeley out to the forest in Sacramento about every three days for a year. Uh, 
and kept our instrument going. And you can see the annual cycle of all the different nitrogen oxides. But what was striking at the time, and is still sort of striking, is that you know, unlike those measurements I showed you from Germany, where the numbers were half a percent, one percent of the of the nitrogen, here there are, the RONO2 molecules shown in red are routinely a quarter of the total in the summer. And that was uh, a pretty striking result. It garnered a lot of uh, criticism, as you might imagine. It was you know, basically 25 times more than other people were saying were these molecules. Uh, Jennifer Murphy went out and we did the same thing uh, a little bit further up the hill, a little bit further away from Sacramento with essentially the same result that a, about a quarter of the or inorganic nitrogen is these organic nitrates. Uh, and then about you know, 10 years after we started this project, we finally found a collaborator with the capabilities of measuring the individual ones. And so some of you may have heard Paul Weinberg show that, talk about this yesterday. Paul's built an instrument where he can look at the specific uh, biogenic nitrates that one would expect to find in the atmosphere. And so here, are the measurements from my group are this dash line, and measurements of specific individual nitrates, or at least classes of nitrates, uh, shown in the colors. So the ones derived from isoprene, by far the single most important molecule emitted to the atmosphere is red. So about half the organic nitrates out at this particular location are the first generation daughters of isoprene, and green and Black here are the second generation daughters, oxidation of either the products that don't contain the nitrate or oxidation of those nitrates. Uh, and in gray, there's a, our molecules which uh, have the right mass signature, but uh, we don't have an, a specific name for, and they're likely monoterpene nitrates. You can see that we have a you know, reasonable closure now, so we have a good sense of what these molecules are in the atmosphere. Um, so. With that analytical uh, tour, the question was, what, what can we learn from these molecules? And I'll just give you a couple of highlights. One of the key things is that in the oxidation chain leading to production of nitrates, the branch that doesn't make the nitrate that continues to propagate the chain makes ozone. So we expect, in a typical sense, to have some relationship between the number of times you make a nitrate and the number of ozone you make, and it's given by that equation there. So it's just two, typically you make two ozone or you, or you make one nitrate. So two times one minus alpha over alpha ends up being the slope. Uh, and so you can go out in the atmosphere and all other things being equal, make a plot of that slope at some location and get the branching ratio for the mixture that you're looking at. And we find those branching ratios vary in interesting ways, uh, but they also have uh, important consequences for the amount of ozone that you might make. So in a, here's a simulation of, in the standard way we might think about ozone production, the rate at which you make ozone in parts per billion per hour as a function on a log scale of the nitrogen oxide concentration and a linear scale on the reactivity of the organics, so the lifetime of OH with respect to reaction with those organics. And if the branching ratio to make the nitrates from the average VOC mixture is 3.5%, it looks like this. And if it's 7%, it looks like that. And that's sort of, that, that range is significant. Uh, and it's the difference in some locations between violating a health-based ozone standard and not. It's certainly a difference in how effective a control strategy might be. Uh, and it's also, it plays out in the nitrogen cycle in a really different way. So we're used to thinking about two limiting cases in the atmospheric chemistry literature. The limiting case where if you're thinking about the hydrogen radicals, OH, HO2, RO2, that when the nitrogen oxides are high, what we do is make nitric acid. And when the nitrogen oxides are low, what we do is make organic hydroperoxides. And in the, in the middle is where these organic nitrates are, are important. And the case I'm showing here is not atypical. This is about what you expect in most cities. That right in the middle, which happens to be right where you're making ozone the fastest, all three of those reactions are equally important. And that's, that's not the sort of characteristic thing we would teach in intro atmospheric chemistry, that where their chemistry is going fastest, all three terms are, are equal. So that, that was an interesting insight that we had, and uh, we've now been spending 
we often we think about it in, ter in this term, in the what happens to the hydrogen radical chain termination. I want you to notice here, if you think about it from a nitrogen radical chain termination, on this side of the curve, you know, NOx below about a part per billion, the primary termination of the nitrogen radical cycle is formation of organic nitrates. So over most of the planet, this is what's going to obtain, that uh, organic nitrates will be the main sink of nitrogen oxides in the atmosphere. Uh, so that's, that was the urban. Here's a plot from a paper that Ann Pering wrote where we flew around in Mexico City and downwind. And you can see the evolution of the different compounds as a, now as a fraction of the total nitrogen oxides. So the, the total is decaying exponentially. But the, we see that in the near field, NOx is oxidized. And then it gets to a steady fraction. The peroxynitrate-like molecules increase and then decrease. They're getting thermally dissociated and going back here. But the fraction that are these or, organic molecules stays absolutely constant uh, over very, very long distances. So 1,000 kilometers downwind of a city, uh, these are still 20% uh, of the total nitrogen. So not an amount that we can afford to ignore if we're trying to get the global balance of nitrogen oxides right. Uh, as, I, as I told you, uh, these yields can vary significantly. So if we look in rural places in the United States, we see an effective branching ratio for the mix of organic molecules. That's around 3 or 4 percent. Uh, cities a little higher, 5 percent. Uh, Mexico City, the highest of any place we ever looked, that was 8. Turns out Bakersfield, California was the lowest place we've ever looked. The number is 2. Uh, and so we're, it's a very useful diagnostic of what's going on in the chemistry. Uh, to be able to try and reproduce both the ozone you make and the chain termination uh, that to the organic nitrates. Uh, the nitrates come from all different kinds of molecules. So here's a figure showing the branching, uh, the, the source molecules for the nitrates in different locations. So the, the NOAA group recently wrote a paper about uh, the deep water horizon emissions, and in that particular case, it's all C6 and larger alkanes that are the source of the organic nitrates. At the Blodgett Forest site, the, the ones that are made locally are all from terpenes, but what we observe are the ones that are transported from this downwind from uh, near Sacramento, Granite Bay, and you can see different mixes in other cities. And so just to wrap it up here, the other thing you can ask is to bring us back to where Neil was taking us and uh, to lead into what John Abbott talks, is going to talk about again, it's the organic aer aerosol in various ways. You can ask the question, do these molecules, which are multifunctional, they have at least most of them, the isoprene ones I showed you, at least one OH and one NO2, and they're likely to get low enough vapor pressure to condense, uh, are those important? And so we built an add-on to our instrument that allowed us to measure the fraction of organic aerosol that's an organic nitrate. And in a pretty uh, exciting result, we found that in the city of Bakersfield, uh, something like a third of the growth of aerosol at night were molecules that had a nitrate group, uh, organic molecules, so not nitric acid, inorganic nitrate, but organic. And we speculate that this is all uh, nitrate radical chemistry. Um, so that, that's an interesting result, and we're uh, continuing to think about how to uh, take that to other parts of the world and think about that. Uh, so let me finish up by saying this is, it's been a really fun set of questions to work on, uh, mostly because I've been able to do this with really fun, fabulous people. And uh, in addition to the students I showed you, I talked to Alan Goldstein and Paul Wenberg and Paul Shepson quite a bit about this, and I want to uh, thank them all for their collaboration, and thank you. Questions? Yes.
So the essence of the question are, uh, if you make a nitrate, does it hydrolyze when it goes into the aerosol? Uh, and I'd say there's, there's mixed evidence for that. There's, from Matt Elrod's lab, there's very good evidence that tertiary nitrates uh, do hydrolyze and form nitric acid, which can then either stay in the particle or go back to the gas phase. Uh, but primary and secondary nitrates don't. Uh, so we think that's an important issue. We th think that means that it may be that the daytime nitrates hydrolyze and the nighttime ones don't because they have different functional uh, behavior. Uh, uh, but it's, it's an important question to work through sort of what classes of nitrates we expect to find in the atmosphere and think about some more. We have some field data. There's a, a paper uh, from Ellie Brown that's on ACPD now and another one we're about to submit that addresses that question from the observational perspective. But we do see evidence both in the organic nitrates and the nitric acid that supports that at least some of the time hydrolysis is happening. Yes. And what about organic nitrates in Germany? Uh, is it the concentration level or the presence of the nitrates? I, I think the, the sorry, the question was uh, what about those organic nitrates I showed from Germany? Uh, I think that the answer to that question is really that I think that the, the analytical technique wasn't measuring the right ones. I, th I think there are plenty of organic nitrates anywhere you go, and the trick is to use an analytical technique capable of, of detecting the ones that are most important in your environment. Um, I know when um, people give talks, and, and I'm sure this is a marvelous talk, but not being in the field is sometimes difficult. And I wonder if you can give a small paragraph of significance of this to, to, the, to the larger picture. Is that possible? So I, I think that this, in the atmospheric chemistry community, one of the, we're concerned with two kinds of things. We're concerned with ozone and ozone, the amount of ozone in our atmosphere with respect to both toxic behavior uh, in the near surface and in the large scale with respect to the greenhouse forcing of ozone. And we're concerned with the amount of aerosol, as you heard in Neil's talk, and basically for the same two reasons. For the role that aerosol plays in uh, local toxicity and for the role it plays globally in uh, setting the radiation balance. And so the key issue that we've been addressing is the role of nitron oxide chemistry in setting the amounts of those two basic quantities that we focus on. There you are, that's good. Um, our next talk is multi-phase oxidation of tropospheric aerosols. Raising the question, are atmospheric organic aerosols reactive? And this is John Abbott from University of Toronto. Okay, well, I'd just like... Okay, thanks. Um, I'd just like to start by... Um, thanking my research group, both uh, past and present, for all their contributions to this work and, and in the past. I mean, it's, it's been a tremendous pleasure to have worked with everyone. A number of, of those people are here today, I know. Um, and I would have liked to have talked about everyone's work, but clearly there wasn't time. And so I'm going to talk about only a subset. And, and I chose to focus on uh, work questions that we're really interested in right now, uh, with, with a, f a fair amount of, of unpublished results in here as well. And so uh, the question I'm asking, and, and the answer to this is um, clearly, just get this pointer working. It seems to have died. I, I've got my own. Um, and so uh, the question is, are atmospheric organic aerosols reactive? And, 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 and the answer to this is clearly yes. But the motivation for this is that in atmospheric chemistry, we've known since its onset that you put an organic molecule in the gas phase and it, and it reacts. And so the question is now when, they're, when those molecules are in the particle, how reactive are they? And so I'm going to um, briefly go through multiphase oxidation chemistry, uh, talk about a case history, uh, uh, looking at the aging of organic aerosol that Neil has introduced very nicely for me by hydroxyl radicals. A number of groups are doing this type of work, not only our own. And then the second half of the talk is to look at uh, potential impacts and some uh, challenges and opportunities for the future. So multiphase oxidation chemistry is, 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 is fairly straightforward. It, it, it just refers to the fact that you can have oxidants either in the gas phase or generated photochemically within, within aerosol, and that the, uh, reactions can then occur either at the interface or within the bulk of the particle. 
And th this isn't a new field. Uh, it's been around for a long time, uh, back to acid rain days when it was discovered that most of sulfur four oxidation occurs in cloud water. Um, when you think about ozone hole chemistry, which is how I got into this field, it's, it's also oxidation chemistry, it, although with different oxidants, because uh, in HCl, the chlorine has to be oxidized to put it into a photochemically active form in, in, in for, for uh, ozone loss to then occur. But most of the field now is focused in on organic aerosol oxidation. And also, increasingly, I think we should be focusing and looking at the oxidation of surfaces at the ground, in part because they're in the boundary layer there's so much surface area at the ground that when you talk about fluxes and, 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 and the generation rate of, um, of uh, uh, gas species, it might be that that chemistry dominates those effects. And so quickly, time scales, again, as, as Neil has talked about, when, when you talk about oxidation time scales for uh, molecules within a, a whole particle, um, the, the, this is not chemistry that occurs on the time scale of hours, very, very close to the source. It's more on the time scale of days. And so you can uh, make some guesses about what oxidant mixing ratios are and what this is the reaction probability, the probability that if a gas phase oxidant sees a particle, it will react. And, and when you do a very simple back of the envelope calculation, you can say that the time scale may be days. If, however, that oxidant is reacting with a surfactant and you're interested in the lifetime of a molecule that likes always to sit at the surface of the particle, then that lifetime comes down quite substantially. Um, but those are just guesses. And so we have to do the experiments to look at them. And so I'm going to start with um, uh, the aging of organic aerosol by hydroxyl radicals. And uh, I, we started in this about five or six years ago, and uh, what we looked at was um, the oxidation of a chemically saturated organic uh, aerosol. And when we started to oxidize it with OH, what we saw was that at low OH exposures, you see a small mass increase. And this is indicative of the hydroxyl uh, radical being taken up by the aerosol and, and, and um, leading to that mass increase. And if the mass had, uh, if that hydroxyl radical continued to be taken up by that aerosol particle, then the mass would have continued to increase along a line like this. But in fact, what we saw was that the mass decreased after a considerable amount of, oxida of oxidation. And um, there's been really nice work done by Jesse Kroll and, and Kevin Wilson on this topic, putting this same mass loss and volatilization relative to what would have occurred in the absence of volatilization onto a, a, a framework looking at how this occurs as a function of the oxygen to carbon ratio of the aerosol. But that view of oxidation really hides the fact that there's a whole lot of really complex chemistry going on in the particle. And so this is just one mass spectrum using, again, one of these toys that um, uh, Neil t alluded to uh, from uh, Doug Worsnop at Aerodyne. This is a uh, high mass resolution uh, time of flight uh, chemical, ionization, chemical ionization mass spectrum of uh, secondary organic aerosol. In this case, what we've done is put it into water and oxidized it with light and a bit of peroxide. And uh, first, you see, in this spectrum, there are literally thousands of peaks and hundreds or thousands of molecules represented. Uh, what, and, and, and so there's a, there's a chemical story associated with each of those, those species. Um, and, and you can see that, for example, this, this clump out here, this is an iodide chemical ionization mass spectrum. This, is, this clump out here is referring to or associated with uh, what we refer to as dimers or, or uh, of, of this alpha pinene backbone. They react away much faster with OH than do the monomers, for example. There's, there's, there's a lot of complexity here. And you can follow it a little bit further. You can uh, guess what some of these master charge ratios are in terms of chemical composition, uh, make an educated guess. And you can follow, for example, cispanonic acid. This is the molecule that Neil was talking about. Uh, you could uh, see that it decays away. And what you form are a whole bunch of products from there, likely products from there, including, for example, this tricarboxylic acid species that is often used as a tracer for alpha pinene oxidation. So that's good. That's, I'm going to skip over the lab now and move to the field. And I, I'm at heart a, a laboratory chemist, but I've learned in this field that to um, really confirm that a lot of what you see in the lab does proceed in, in, in the field, you, it, it's valuable to go and do these experiments on real aerosol. And so we took, we, we took the opportunity to do this uh, by collaborating with Environment Canada at a field study that they were running in 2010 in the forests in uh, British Columbia near Whistler. And we were fortunate enough to be there when the um, 
the temperature was high, the trees were putting out a lot of terpenes, forming a lot of organic aerosol. And at some times, there was almost no uh, sulfate measurable. So this was a pure organic aerosol that we could study this oxidation chemistry upon. And so we took our lab experiments and did them in the field. We have an experiment where we ex expose ambient particles to very high concentrations of OH. Um, and it's uh, appropriate to question whether those high concentrations of OH are, are relevant. But we, we, um, we expose the particles for a few minutes to high concentrations of OH, corresponding to a few days of, of OH exposure in, under ambient conditions. And these oscillations here are... Uh, indicative of this volatilization effect. They're, they're, they're related to this OH source being turned on and off in, in our experiment. And so you see mass loss. You see these aerosols volatilizing as you, as you oxidize them. And the way that you can view uh, the degree of oxygenation that, um, or one way that you can view the, the degree of oxygenation that these aerosols assume via this process is um, motivated by a paper, a very nice paper that came out from Sally Ng, published a couple of years ago, and in particular, using the technique that, that uh, the aerodyne aerosol mass spectrometer, which is our um, window onto this world, uh, what Sally did was take just two specific mass to charge ratios, 44 and 43, indicative of a highly oxygenated component of the molecules in the aerosol and of a less oxygenated component. And when you plot just those two mass to charge ratios, you find that a large amount of field data fall within this common envelope with less oxidized, fresher aerosol down here and, and more aged aerosol up here. And just to put a couple of reference, point for, reference points from our own group on this figure, um, this biogenic SOA event in Whistler is, is, is down here within this, this figure. And then we had a, a graduate student in my group, Rachel Chang, spent some time on an icebreaker very close to the North Pole looking at aerosol that will have been in the atmosphere much longer, will have been much more oxidized. And that point uh, for that campaign is, is quite a bit higher in that space. And so when you uh, do this ambient OH oxidation experiment, so you take biogenic aerosol at Whistler, expose it to a lot of OH, and oxidize it, you do move in this very simple uh, uh, phase space uh, to a, uh, uh, a in, in the right trajectory to, 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 to form aerosol that, as viewed by the AMS, has the right um, composition. But as I alluded to earlier, this oxidation may not occur just with OH in the gas phase. It can also occur with OH within the aerosol or within a cloud droplet. And, and Barbara Turpin has been promoting very nicely for the last decade or so the idea that within cloud droplets, you may have photochemistry occurring. And, uh, and in fact, the same type of analogous type of chemistry may occur in aerosol as well. And so you'll form oxidants within the, the bulk. Uh, the cloud droplets may evaporate. And what you would be left with is a more massive and more oxygenated aerosol. And so we tried to mimic that in the field, uh, at least qualitatively. Um, by taking cloud water, so we collected cloud water on site. We didn't have to ship it or freeze it and worry whether little bugs are going to start to grow in it. Um, and so we did an in-situ oxidation experiment by adding a little bit of peroxide, turning on the UV light, atomizing that uh, solution, drying it out as it might dry out in, in the environment, and then analyzing it with the AMS. And sure enough, you see the same um, trajectory within this 44, 43 space. Um, when you dry this oxidation quite hard with a fair bit of peroxide and light. What was interesting, though, so in this regard, this, this behavior was similar to what you see with aerosol. Um, one thing that was different, though, between cloud samples and aerosol samples is that when it, whenever we did our aerosol oxidation experiments, we lost mass. This was this volatilization effect that I was referring to earlier. Um, but when we oxidized cloud water, uh, we saw a mass increase in what was being observed by the AMS and the, this aerosol mass spectrometer. And uh, our understanding of this is that within cloud water, you have, uh, it's, it's, it's expected that you would have soluble but rel relatively volatile organics, small organics like small aldehydes. And normally the AMS, uh, within an aerosol, they would not partition to an aerosol, the AMS would not observe them. But by doing this oxidation, we can um, four more oxygenated species that, that, that then do reside in the aerosol and are detected by the, by the aerosol mass spectrometer. And so this is a confirmation that this hypothesis that cloud water, when it is oxidized, will form additional mass and that it is highly ox oxygenated. 
So I'm going to spend the second, the last six or seven minutes of my talk on um, potential impacts and go through these fairly quickly. The, the first one is on climate. You might, uh, it, it's reasonable to expect that the, as you do this oxidation, the particles may become more uh, oxygenated and likely more, the components will be more soluble, perhaps lower molecular weight, so the CCN activity of the aerosol may increase. We were fortunate enough at Whistler to be able to do these, C, what are referred to as CCN activation experiments, online as we were doing the OH oxidation experiments. And, and we saw that in both cases, both with aqueous phase oxidation and gas phase OH oxidation, we saw the CCN activity increasing um, in, in, in line with uh, increasing oxygen to carbon ratio. But there's a rough correspondence with the oxygen to carbon ratio of the aerosol. You can ask how important this is. Um, in, a, in a continental environment with a lot of particles and a lot of sulfate around, it probably is not very important. It, it would have be of more importance in, in, a, in a remote environment where the aerosol is, is dominated largely by the organic component. I think that most of this multi-phase chemistry as we pursue it into the future is, is going to have its importance in the toxicological field. And uh, if you have specific toxins within a particle that can be oxidized, this represents a, a loss process for them. There's uh, not much known uh, of the mechanisms by which particles affect human health. It's known that we're affected by breathing in particles, but the mechanisms are not well known. One of the mechanisms is referred to as oxidative stress, which is the um, imbalance between antioxidants and oxidants within the body. And um, one way to drive oxidative stress is, is via something referred to as redox cycling. And the idea here is that within particulate matter, there are components that are good electron transfer agents. And they can take electrons from something that's being oxidized, like an antioxidant, like glutathione, and uh, uh, shuttle them over to oxygen and form a reactive oxygen species in, in, in the body, such as hydrogen peroxide. So there's now a chemical assay to measure the rate of this, this electron transfer chemistry. And uh, it's been shown that it's highly uh, reactive to uh, or, uh, quit small species like quinones and, and transition metals that are in, in particles. Um, and so we did, we've done a number of systems. I'll just show you one system here, a complex one. We took a two-stroke engine. So this is the type of engine that's on a moped. It's a major pollution source in, in industrially developing cities. Um, and we took that exhaust. We denuded it. We tried to scrub off as many of the VOCs as possible. So we were just oxidizing the particles with ozone. And sure enough, what we found was that as we oxidized the particles, um, the uh, redox activity of, this, of these particles increased. And we don't know what the chemical species are that are doing this. We've tried to measure the, the crime, the, the, the um, uh, culprits that are usually identified, like small quinones and tr transition metals, but we can only account in a closure sense for maybe 5% of this activity. Um, so th there's a really complex chemical mixture here that needs to be studied in this regard. Um, and then last, one final effect is what I uh, mentioned earlier on, is that there can be sources uh, from this oxidation chemistry of, of gas phase VOCs. Uh, Paul Wenberg did a very nice modeling study of this a number of years ago, showing that these are potentially of importance in the upper, upper and free troposphere. In the boundary layer, you tend to think that the gas phase chemistry is going to dominate. Um, but, uh, but when you, um, uh, sorry. Uh, but, but in some circumstances, there may be a significant source of VOCs from the surface. I've been intrigued by these measurements that Reiner Volkmer has been uh, uh, illustrating of glyoxal being formed, for example, in remote environments. And so we've, uh, sorry, moving the wrong way. There we go. So we've in, uh, started up a project to look at the oxidation of some components of the sea surface microlayer with ozone. So this is the, uh, an experiment where we're oxidizing a polyunsaturated fatty acid. And what you see from that is the formation of small aldehydes. And interestingly, you do see, and this is a collaboration now with Reiner, uh, small levels of glyoxal being formed from that chemistry and, and also of another dicarbonyl, a three-carbon dicarbonyl referred to as malondialdehyde. So I'm just going to wrap up in the last one minute with um, some challenges and opportunities. Uh, do we know the supply of oxidants that's able to drive this chemistry? In the gas phase, we do. Within the particle, the photochemical sources of these, I don't think we know well. And Jin Chu Mao gave a very nice talk on this yesterday. Um, 
Is there, are there mass transfer limitations that affect the rates of this chemistry? Again, in the gas phase, there are likely not, but within the particle, if this SOA is highly viscous, then there can be diffusion limitations, and we have a talk on this topic on Friday afternoon. And lastly, can we trust that bulk reaction mechanisms really predict multiphase oxidation chemistry? And clearly, within bulk water, such as in a cloud droplet, they, they probably do. But when you get into this really concentrated environment of an aerosol or at the interface, I think we don't know um, uh, that that's the case. And so I'll just uh, conclude very quickly. Uh, organic aerosol is reactive. Um, the effects are on both the bulk properties of the particles, but also specific components. We have a good framework for qualitatively understanding this chemistry, but the quantitative understanding is still developing. Uh, but this provides a lot of opportunities for future study. With that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Um, questions? Yeah, the question is, what is lost from the aerosol upon oxidation? We've done experiments where we've um, taken organic film and exposed it to OH radicals. And uh, uh, we haven't done this with SOA. We would like to do that again. We worked with more chemically reduced substances. And what you see are a whole slew of aldehydes and carboxylic acids coming off the surface. Formic acid always wins. It's the major species that's formed when you expose a surface to OH. You see it even coming off when you take... Uh, a soot surface and expose it to OH, what you see is formic acid coming out. Brian, yes. Yeah, so the question is um, uh, organics on aerosols in the stratosphere, uh, and they're not there. Yes, I know, and so I was going to say that there's a talk coming up on, on stratospheric aerosol from, from Dan Murphy later this morning. Um, well, uh, cl clearly there, there are uh, a, a number of processes. One is that if they were on the particle, then they would be subject to this chemistry. They could have been chewed off. Uh, but then you've got, first got, got to get the organics onto the aerosol in the stratosphere. And so you know, the or organics in the stratosphere tend to be not very common aside from methane. So uh, that would be probably my first guess. I actually will be talking about this. Okay. <laughs> Great. It's an advertisement for you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, for the sins of my life, I've been to Dakar, Bangladesh, 17 times. And uh, uh, one of the amazing things there is the pollution, uh, mainly by, by the rickshaws, which are little, uh, uh, I guess, um, uh, like a moped, two-stroke motor. And they changed all of a sudden to um, natural gas, and the pollution improved enormously at that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's my contribution. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm to say something about chemistry. <laughs> okay, our next, qu our next uh, speaker is uh, René Jang from uh, Texas A&M, and uh, he's going to talk. and the formation, transformation, and climate impacts of atmospheric aerosols. Congratulations. Thanks, Kevin. All right, uh, I try to follow up uh, about what has been said about atmospheric aerosols. Uh, uh, so basically, aerosols can form in the atmosphere by a lot of different pathways, and uh, uh, so some of the particles are directly emitted into the atmosphere, which are known as primary particles, whereas others form in the atmosphere through the gas to particle conversion process. Uh, um, and uh, the, the, part, the, the, the chemicals that are, can be responsible for the gas to particle conversion process may involve sulfate. Uh, we have power plant emissions, of sulfur dioxide, oxidized to sulfur acid. And sulfur acid can play a big role in the nucleation growth of those uh, atmospheric particles. Uh, in addition, we have ammonia, or some, sometime, other times we may have organic ammonia amines, and those can neutralize sulfur acid, also contribute to the gas particle conversion. But a lot of times we may, we may have a lot of organics that contribute to aerosol formation. New Donahue talked a lot, of, a lot of, about those. Um, so those 
Volatile organic compounds are oxidized in the atmosphere by oxidants, and then some of the product may contribute to a aerosol formation process. Um, so, uh, so, so we can have primary particles and secondary particles, and then they undergo this trans growth transmission processes, and eventually to form uh, submicron particles, and those particles can, can block sunlight, so they can con contrib contribute to cooling in the atmosphere, and also some of the particles provide seeds, um, to form cloud droplets, uh, cloud condensation nuclei, or ice nuclei that also can block uh, sunlight. So roughly speaking, so about half of the particles in the atmosphere are formed by the secondary route. And uh, so this is gonna be the topic I'm gonna be emphasizing uh, in my presentation. Um, and uh, so, 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 so uh, uh, Ron Cohen talked about the importance of aerosols in the climate system. Jiang Nabe talk, also talked about this. So, so we have greenhouse gases contribute to warming in the atmosphere, whereas aerosols direct in fact uh, uh, reflecting sunlight and influ influencing cloud formation that both contribute to cooling in the atmosphere. So if we add up all the different forcing component according to IPCC, so roughly the forcing, the average forcing unit here is about 1.5 watts per square meter, but this act, the, 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 the relative value here can vary from 0.6 to um, to uh, about 2.8. And, and uh, the point here is that the largest error bar here actually come from the aerosol terms. So, so in the climate system, uh, aerosols actually represent the largest uncertainty in climate forcing. Um, uh, this is an article I wrote for National Geographic a few years ago. I think the key point I like to make here is that uh, aerosols basically can fundamentally change uh, cloud formation processes. Uh, let me give you some examples here. Uh, here. Here's an article we published in JGR uh, back in 2008. Uh, and here we look into the response of precipitation, which is on the left panel, and also the cloud coverage to the increasing amount of uh, cloud condensation nuclei. So, so what you can see here is that if we increase CC in concentration here, and the, uh, the precipitation initially can increase, and then reach a peak value and start to decrease. And, um, and for relatively clean conditions like in developed countries like US, Europe, I think our aerosol concentrations fall in this category here. So in this case, aerosol can actually enhance precipitation if you increase uh, 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 aerosol can enhance precipitation, but if you fall into other scenarios such as political ca cases like China, India, and you may actually run into this scenario, whereas aerosols can completely suppress uh, precipitation. A similar curve you can see for uh, cloud coverage. And this is a MODIS satellite showing a large plume of uh, uh, haze covering most part of China. And also you can see the, the jet stream actually blow most of the this, uh, this, this dust into the Pacific regions, um, the, the Pacific region. And we had an article published in um, uh, 2007, and we believe those ancient pollution plume may actually have a major impact on the storm track over the Pacific uh, region. So, so the, the, the question here is how those aerosol particles form in the atmosphere, and uh, New Donna, can you show this uh, banana uh, uh, curve here? But this is one, I, 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 there's a couple points i like to make, uh, to, to mention here. Uh, those are measurements of new particle formation in a very polluted uh, city, Beijing, China. And this study was done by my colleagues, I Minghu mean, from uh, Peking University during the uh, 2008 Summer uh, Olymp Olympic Games. And again, so you see the, the vertical axis here is the particle size, and this horizontal axis here is the time. So around 10, 11, you see very high concentration. So the contours here are number concentration of particles. So at time around 10, 11, you see very high concentration of nanoparticles, three nanometers, and uh, the number concentration exceed, well exceed uh, uh, 10,000 particles per cubic meter. And the other feature to notice is that during the course of the day, you see the size of the particles actually uh, increases from three nanometers to about 100 nanometers. So, that's, so those nanoparticles grow very efficiently under atmospheric uh, conditions. And the bottom panel here shows a correlation of those newly formed particles, three to 20 nanometers, a number concentration, and their correlation to measured gas phase concentration of sulfuric acid. And you actually see those two correlate very well which is indicative of the sulfuric acid may play a big role here uh, in, 
uh, new particle formation. But there's a problem here. If you look into the absolute value of those sulfuric acid, and those are those concentrations are well be uh, below uh, parts per trillion. Um, so even in the very polluted cities like Beijing, and their concentration is very, very low. So you're going to have a hard time trying to explain, to, to explain this kind of growth by considering sulfuric acid. So there can be other species that also contributing to this process here. Um, so we have an article of just recently being published. We review all the theories concerning uh, aerosonucleations. Uh, there are some very important con considerations here. So thermodynamics, you can look into the first law, the second law. So the first law has to do with uh, the enthalpy term, uh, the enthalpy. The second law has to do with entropy. And so, so, so the nucleation process is going this direction here, vapor to liquid or vapor to solid. So that in this case, both NSOP and NTOP are decreased. So court, first law, no problem. Second law, then we run into a problem here. Uh, um, and so that also translates. So if you look into the free energy here, so because this is a negative term here, this is also negative. And then you multiply by this. So the, you can actually potentially have a big positive term there when particles are nucleated uh, in the atmosphere. Um, uh, of course, we can treat the aerosol growth process using the classic nucleation series. So two, two terms here. So one has to do with the difference in the chemical potentials. The other has to do with the creation of those uh, uh, surfaces. Uh, so if the thermodynamic system is subsaturated, the free energy will increase indef indefinitely. And if we have supersaturated uh, thermodynamic system, the free energy may initially increase, reach a peak, then start to decrease. Um, and of course, you can decide, decide the size of the, this peak here, which is known as a critical nucleus. And, uh, and, and uh, so that's dependent on supersaturation and some other thermodynamic properties. The other way you can also express this equation is to write the supersaturation as, func as a function of particle size. This is also known as the Kelvin, uh, the Kelvin equation. And, and the important point to mention here is that, so if you look into this, the critical supersaturation here for particle formation, and that is inversely proportional to particle size. So the smaller particles is very, very large supersaturation. So essentially, when we're dealing with nucleation processes, there are two barriers. So one has to do with the free energy barrier, and the second barrier is the, is the Kelvin barrier. So very small particles, extremely elevated some of, uh, equilibrium vapor pressures. Um, and again, so I talk about this uh, nucleation process is uh, increasing free energy. So, to, so th that's the free energy barrier we have to overcome. So once the particles are nucleated, and then the, the other barrier to consider is the, uh, is the, uh, is the, uh, is the, uh, the, the Kelvin barrier. So, 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 so it's, it's, a very, it's going to be very difficult for a newly formed particle form. And whatever going to condense here has to be extremely non-volatile. Um, and so why we care about this nucleation process? Because uh, there's a very, a very simple um, thermodynamic principle, which is referred as a nucleation theorem, and that has to do with the chemical composition of this critical nucleus at the peak of this, and also the, the, the nucleation rate and also gases concentration. So, so if we understand the, the nucleation process very well, then we can develop a very simple physic, physically based parameter parameterizations to represent this process in atmospheric models, in, in, in global climate models. So, so in all atmospheric models, people have to, if people have to get uh, aerosol number concentration right, you have to have the right nucleation rate. So if we understand this process, then we can have a better understanding of, uh, we can have a better understanding of the. Uh, so we, over the last many years, we've been looking to study uh, nucleation growth of nanoparticles, and we do uh, theoretical studies, experimental studies, and we have also done some um, field measurements uh, in the atmosphere. And um, just very quickly, so uh, this is a setup we use to study nanoparticle formation. So we have the precursors of uh, uh, aerosols introduced into a reactor. We monitor the concentration of those gases, and then we monitor the formation of those newly, part uh, newly nucleated particles. So this is uh, just a co collaboration of those. We use a uh, particle size magnifier. We can measure 
particle size up to one to two nanometers. And so this is the one case that we study the contribution of organics to aerosonucleation. And again, so this is number concentration versus particle size, so two to four nanometers. And the bottom curve here corresponds to particle nucleation in the presence of sulfur gas and water and only. So that's a binary nucleation. However, in our experiments, if we add um, a organics, this is cis panotic acid at different concentrations, and we see the concentrations of, of those nanoparticles actually increases uh, with the increasing concentration of organic, uh, organic acid. And then we have done this uh, nucleation studies fairly systematically, looking to the dependence on sulfuric acid, on, on organic acid, and et cetera. And then we fit the data using nucleation serum. Uh, roughly, so we believe the critical nucleus may actually contain one organic acid and plus three to four sulfuric acid. Uh, molecules, and a few years back, we also looked into the contribution of some other organic acids. This is a benzoic acid, uh, or one of the organic acid, uh, aromatic acid. So they also, so if you increase benzoic acid concentration, you actually see increase in concentration of uh, new particles. And, and we also look into why organic acid contribute uh, to uh, particle formation, so this is the organic acid molecules. They have a, the distinct uh, carboxylic function groups, uh, CO and COH, so they can form very strong hydrogen bonding with uh, the oxygens uh, in sulfuric acid molecules. And once you form this dimer here, you can further add another sulfuric acid, you can add amines, so can, you can add, add other waters and etc. And the other point I'd like to mention here is if you have two organic acid molecules, so they also form very strong complex. But the problem here is that so once these two active sites are occupied, and there's nothing else you can add to those to, to this complex here. So we don't believe those uh, those dimers of organics can contribute to a new particle formation. And this is a, a molecular dynamic simulation we perform. So this is a big organic acid molecule here. So this is a carboxylic fun uh, function group. So add sulfuric acid. Then on the other side, you can add as many of the sulfuric acid, water, or any other species um, you wish. And we also collect some of those aerosols and to, to analyze the chemical composition of those, uh, those particles. And this is set up we, do, um, uh, we use to analyze chemical composition. And we hope we may, might be able some days to, uh, to add the capability of uh, time flight. Uh, anyway, so, uh, so what we do here is that we collect those particles and for a certain time, then we heat up those particles and look into the desorption of those masses from those, uh, um, from, from the, uh, from, uh, Desorbed uh, masses. So what you can see here is that uh, once, if we have desorption going on here, we saw a big peak here that corresponds to sulfuric acid. Some other times we also see uh, uh, organic acid coming out. But if we compare the relative magnitude of those, we find a lot of those are actually sulfuric acid. Only very small is made of uh, uh, organic acid here. Um, and, uh, and we can add a lot of more, uh, very high concentration of those organic acids. Still, they don't actually show up in the desorption spectrum. And we believe the primary reason is because they, they only involve in the nucleation process, but because the, uh, the, the, those organic acids are largely hydrophobic, uh, hydrophobic so they don't, they don't necessarily contribute um, to a particle growth. And just very quickly, so we have done some experiments to look into some other species contributing to this, uh, the, the, the growth. So we generate nanoparticles and uh, uh, in the nucleation chamber. We select the particle size with one DMA. Then we introduce into another reactor, then monitor the, incre the, different, the increase in the particle size. So this ra the ratio of those two DMAs provides the size growth factor here. And we look into different species. Uh, we look into uh, ammonia here. So we use very high concentration of ammonia. And we also look into amines and some organic compounds like 2,4-hectyno uh, and, uh, and, 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 and glyxo. And in the case of ammonia, we never see the particle grow because those are basically uh, uh, neutralization reactions. And ammonia is very small molecules in, in the case of uh, a mean, uh, a means we do see some growth, and we see some even growth very small particles. And for those different organics, we see 
growth, but those growths are size dependent. They also dependent on the relative humidity. So in our experiments, we don't actually control the acidity. The, all, the, the only factor we control is relative humidity. So if the RH is very low, the acid is very concentrated, and, and vice versa. And so, so just a, very quickly to see what are the mechanisms. And so this is a molecule of 2,4-hexadienyl uh, here, so the two unsaturated uh, carbonyls. And, and, and so those large aldehydes can engage in hydrogenase reactions fairly efficiently by uh, a, 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 so the proton added here to form, uh, and, and, and the charge get lost to form the protonate forms, and proton add here, and, uh, and, uh, and charge transfer them to see uh, inos, and then those uh, protonate forms and inos can combine to form polymers. And those polymers have extremely, exceedingly low vapor pressures. And a couple points here. So, the, uh, so this kind of reaction, a lot of aldehydes acid catalyze. So, so, so the concentrated acid, the more, uh, more, more, more efficient the, the, the will, this reaction will taking place. And second, those are all high water reactions. So you need at least a couple of those molecules or more of those molecules to form those extremely non-volatile species. Um, uh, this is a case for Glyxo, so there's uh, alpha dicarbonyls, they engage very efficiently hydration reactions uh, to form diol tetraels, then you have, and the point here is those are hydration reactions, um, uh, and, and therefore the higher of the water re activity, the more efficient reactions, and also the, uh, those reactions secondary water, and uh, means they basically engage in uh, neutralization reactions amongst them. Um, to, uh, to form a, a meaning salt. So, so basically we understand that why the different species behave so differently, why, they, why they're dependent so differently on RH, why they're dependent on size. Uh, and we also collect some samples. In fact, we saw some of the polymers in our uh, chemical analyzation uh, analysis from aldehyde reactions and also for, from those um, reactions with uh, mysol, uh, 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 glyxo molecules. Okay, I'm gonna stop here. Thank you very much. Time for a few questions. Well, I do, oh, please, yes, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. Can you repeat the question? Okay, uh, so I, I, think, I, I think what Neil, uh, Neil mentioned was that uh, in our case, we look into the contribution of uh, uh, cis panolic acid to nanoparticle growth, and Neil mentioned that there may be some other highly oxidized uh, species that may indeed contribute to the growth process. I, uh, I think my response is that I fully agree with this, and in our case, we only look into very limited species. There's many, many other compounds that may actually participate in the, in the nucleation and growth process. I, I do have a, something that struck me. You, you mentioned the secondary effects of, of um, uh, aerosols on, on precipitation appear to be different in, uh, regionally. The, the um, India, China versus uh, uh, the United States. Could you, could you comment on that? Uh, yeah, I, I think there's a pretty large community uh, looking into aerosol uh, cloud interaction, and uh, uh, Danny Rosenfield is one of the folks, and there are many folks at uh, PNL. And uh, I, I, I think the, the impact of aerosol on precipitation is extremely complex. It uh, depends on what kind of a cloud systems you have, and depend on the absolute concentrations. Uh, I think what about, my understanding is that uh, the the different aerosol concentration may have different impact on the on, on the amount of precipitation and also different uh, cloud types. So people believe that uh, aerosols may actually inhibit light precipitation, may actually, uh, on the other hand, enhance uh, heavy precipitation. So it's a very complicated picture. Thank you very much. Uh, I have an announcement to make. Um, uh, first, uh, fellow nominations are due.
in, under a new scheme uh, March 15th uh, this, of next year. There's a two-month window. Uh, all, in fact, all union and all uh, um, uh, section awards do have that deadline. Uh, the second thing is tonight, the fellows, uh, not just from our section, for, from atmospheric sciences, but also from uh, the whole union, uh, will be presented at the, at the honors ceremony. Uh, our next speaker is Bob Howes, who was our Bjorkness speaker, and he's going to talk about satellite radar studies of extreme convective storms. Uh, Bob is from the University of Washington. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction, and I want to express my appreciation for being designated as a fellow. It's a great, uh, great, great honor. Um, and it's also nice to be able to have a little chance here to talk about some of the uh, really exciting things that I, I feel that we're doing at the University of Washington in my group. The topic I've chosen, we're doing many things, but the topic I've chosen is to um, highlight our satellite radar studies of extreme convective uh, storms around the world, and in particular, we're focusing on um, how extreme convective storms occur in relationship to the main mountain ranges of the world, the big ones, the Rockies, the Andes, and the Himalayas. Um, this is all possible because of this wonderful uh, opportunity we've had since the late 90s to have radars in space orbiting on satellites. This has really changed the game uh, in studying um, uh, convective storms around the world. There's the CloudSat satellite that went up in uh, 2006, which looks at non-precipitating primarily. And uh, the TRIM satellite, which is, uh, has a radar on board that looks at precipitating clouds. And we're, we're using both. Uh, and we this, this just is, is a little illustration of how these, uh, these two radars differ. The, uh, the CloudSat radar uh, looks at the non, has a very short wavelength, three millimeters, and it looks at, as a result, at uh, non-precipitating clouds. The uh, TRIM satellite, on the other hand, has a two centimeter wavelength, which is good for looking at the precipitating parts of cloud populations. So the two together are forming a, uh, Unfortunately, they're not in the same orbit, but, but they are uh, forming a much better story of, of um, what we know about convection around the world. And as I said, I'm focusing here and today on, on the more extreme convective uh, occurrences that take place near the major mountain ranges. And here on the left is the, uh, are the, are the Himalayas and the uh, mountains of Afghanistan over here. Uh, the most in, uh, some of the most intense convection in the world congregates here in this little nook or corner between the Afghan plateau and the Himalayas. And another hot spot is um, in the uh, in in uh, western Argentina, just uh, near the near the Andes. And I should say here that Ed Zipser was the first one to point these uh, these things out. This, this this is where the most extreme convection occurs. Um, and as I said, I'm going to look at all three mountain ranges here very, very briefly. And one of the things we're trying to chase down is how, how similar is the deep convection in, um, in, these, in these three mountain ranges and to what extent is it different. First, let's look at the North American case, which is very familiar to uh, American uh, weather forecasting types and basically anybody that watches CNN or the Weather Channel. We know a lot about uh, intense convection over the uh, central U.S. We know that the, uh, the moisture comes from the Gulf of Mexico in a, in a shallow layer of very, very warm, moist, unstable air. And it is capped by um, dry flow off of the Mexican plateau that um, it comes down and, and keeps the convection from easily breaking out. And it can't break out until it's, it's triggered by some process. And in the U.S., it's usually some meteorological phenomenon like a front, dry line, gravity wave or something that, that allows the convection to break through this capping uh, effect from the mountains. Um, 
There's similar, uh, something similar happens um, over in South Asia in that little nook between Afghanistan and, uh, and the Himalayas. And this was pointed out many, many years ago by Sawyer in 1947, uh, using very primitive data. It showed that the, the, the low level flow, moist flow off the Arabian Sea was capped by a dry flow off the Afghan plateau and the convection the intense convection didn't break out until something could, could break the cap and, and the convection could erupt out of, out of that moist layer. Um, and we've modernized that uh, um, Sawyer study a bit by using TRIM data. On the left, you see data from the TRIM satellite, the uh, horizontal uh, cross-section of the top, vertical on the bottom. And the colors indicate uh, where the convection, or where the rain is most intense, and that's uh, the, by the yellows. And uh, the Afghanistan is over here, the Himalayas over here. And across, along this cross section, you see a lot of very intense convective cells poking up in the vertical. We ran a simulation of this case uh, with the WARF model, got reasonably uh, good results that look somewhat like like the real case. They look enough like the real case that we can, we can dig into the model and, and um, investigate the mechanisms better than we can just from the, data, uh, the satellite data alone. Uh, first of all, I'll point out that the trajectories are just like uh, Sawyer said they should be, low level flow off the Arabian Sea, overridden by flow off the Afghan cap, uh, plateau capping the, uh, the moist layer in this region here. The model uh, shows uh, details. The moist, this shows the moist flow coming up into that region. The, the moist air is, is the most moist air is, is, is the reddish colors. And as this air comes up from the south uh, and is overridden by the flow off the Afghan plateau, it picks up sensible heat from, the, from its traverse of the desert. And this cape quantity is a measure of the of the overall instability of the air, and it becomes maximum up here in this region after it's been this more moist air, already unstable, has been heated by the desert, it gets up here, it's very, very unstable, just ready to explode. But the question is what makes it uh, trigger? And what the model tells us is that the first small foothill that's encountered by the, uh, by the moist flow is enough to trigger the convection, let it break through the cap, and, and that's the beginning of this, of this deep convective scenario. So the orography is, a, is, a, uh, is an important feature here. And from, from many, many satellite observations, we see this always occurs over the lowlands uh, and not over the, over the higher terrain. Uh, something similar happens uh, in the region of the Andes. Here's South America. Here, the moist source is not an ocean, but rather the Amazon. And the air, uh, moist air from the Amazon at low levels flows down, is channeled by this high barrier, the Andes, works its way down into this region of uh, western Argentina here, where we know that the intense convection occurs. It, this moist air encounters uh, these low mountains here. There's a separate range, the Sierra Cordoba mountains are uh, an older range, uh, not quite as high out of east of the uh, Andes. And then there's also foot various foothills in the Andes that trigger the convection when the moist air gets down into this region. So we focus on this region. We know this is where the most intense convection occurs from the trim satellite climatology. Uh, this is just an example. It shows one case that gets triggered over the Sierra Cordoba range and grows into a big mesoscale system. Uh, we looked at it with with the trim radar data, it looks very similar to systems we see over the U.S. with a, with a leading convective line, a very intense convection, followed by a stratiform region. That we, and Chris and Rasmussen and I have done um, uh, sort of quasi-statistical examination of, of these storms and found that they, they exhibit characteristics very similar to what, uh, what we've seen over uh, Oklahoma and Kansas. But the real point here is what we're trying to get at is what leads to the breakout of the convection. Again, we get um, um, capping of, the, of the, uh, the moist layer 
downstream of mountains. But in this case, it's a little different story here. It's more of a gravity wave response to the high, to the high barrier here. These westerlies at these latitudes here, they come across here, they go up on the west side, and then as they come down, this subsidence is enough to, to hold back the, um, the convec convection in this moist air that's coming down parallel to the Andes until it hits this, uh, the, these mountains down here in, in western Argentina, the lower mountains. So, um, just to, re to recap what I've said so far, in these, these large mountain ranges near uh, warm, moist zones, we see some similarities. Channeling of moisture uh, by the mountain ranges, we see um, capping uh, of, the, um, of the moist layer by uh, down, warm, dry downslope uh, flow uh, downwind of the mountain range. And we see explosive triggering uh, near the base of the mountain ranges. The differences are the capping can be for different reasons. The capping may be downslope from a plateau like uh, the Mexican plateau or the Afghan plateau, or it may be um, a gravity wave response to a flow over a, over a ridge, as in the case of the Andes. The triggering uh, can be more of a meteorological nature as it is in the U.S., or it can be more orographic as it is in um, South Asia and South America, where this warm, moist uh, flow is held back until it, until it encounters uh, some lower uh, terrain. It's enough to get it past its parcels, past the level of free convection. Um, and this is just an example that I wanted to show you. It's uh, kind of a fun example to see how these, these storms look similar in these different parts of the world. Uh, we're using somewhat similar techniques to study uh, other things, like the uh, these uh, flood cases over Pakistan that we've seen for the last three years. Uh, we've got a couple of papers in a bulletin to the AMS already on that and some more things coming out. Um, we're using these techniques to look at convection in the Madden-Julian oscillation, differences between land and ocean, and a, and a variety of other things. I wanted to close, though, thinking more about the future. We've been so lucky to have these uh, satellites. The, this is sort of a representation of the CloudSat orbit. And this is a representation of the trim orbit. You can see they're not, they're not in the same orbit, but uh, this is what's been given as the precipitation part of the story and the, and the non-precipitating part of the story. A CloudSat is gonna be, re, be a, there's gonna be a follow-on to CloudSat. These CloudSat and trim have, uh, are coming to the end of their lifetimes. The Europeans are, are getting ready to launch Earth Care, which will be a follow-on to CloudSat. And of course, here in the US and Japan, we're thinking about GPM, which will be a, a kind of a follow-on for trim, rather similar properties. But again, the, and the orbits will be a little different. But uh, again, the, uh, the cloud and precipitation radars are not in the same orbit. Nevertheless, we've got a good decade or so more to, to, to follow on these studies uh, and continue this, this look at, at convection over the whole globe with these uh, amazing radars in space. But what I would really like to think about is the generation even further beyond, because a lot of you here are young enough to, uh, to be thinking about what happens after GPM and Earth Care. And for this, I would really advocate uh, getting these satellites in the, in the same orbit. I know other people are, are thinking about this issue too. I know I'll be in the nursing home by the time this happens, but, but, but some of you won't be, and I think uh, it would be a good idea for you to be uh, thinking about the configuration of this next, next round of satellites. With that, I think I will uh, conclude things. Thanks again, Peter and Alan. Uh, thanks, Bob. Questions? I have a question about predictability, if, uh, especially in the uh, Andes and the um, uh, South Asian case, where, where we know that the, the pulses of the Pakistan floods for the last three years are highly predictable by Eastern WF, uh, but the flash floods have always been a problem. And uh, I'm wondering that given the orographic nature and the similarity of the low-level moist flow, if there is indeed predictability uh, in the foothills of the Himalayas. Well, yeah, there, I'm not 
quite sure exactly what the question is, but except that, that uh, the... Uh, can they be forecast? Yeah, the, the, I, think, I think they... Yeah, okay, so they can be forecast. Uh, um, we've been looking at uh, one of the most notorious flash floods in the Himalayas, the uh, Lay Flood that occurred in 2010. Um, and uh, you know, killed about 400 people in the in the Lay Valley. It happened very, very suddenly one night. And uh, there's a lot of things that we can see uh, leading up to it. One thing is the nature of the storm itself. The no the mesoscale character of the storm was unusual, but probably predictable in a at least in a higher re higher resolution um, regional model. Um, I could talk in detail about that. That storm formed in a very unusual way over the Tibetan Plateau, which is a very rare scenario. And then it moved off the edge, edge of the Himalayas, where it was then fed by moist flow from the um, Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea. But the other important point I wanted to make, Peter, that I think uh, really uh, addresses the, reflect, uh, the uh, predictability is that, that we've been able to um, simulate the behavior of the lay flood with a, with a coupled land um, land atmosphere model, uh, high resolution regional model, but with the, with the land surf, surface included for uh, hydrologic purposes. And it was really a matter of the, uh, the, mo the soil moisture and these ordinarily very barren dry mountain slopes building up over, over several previous days. There were two or three pre preceding events of a very similar nature. Um, but didn't give the flash flood. But finally, the, the moisture, soil moisture got so great that, that uh, we ended up in the third, third time it was hit, it, it, uh, mm -hmm. it got the flash, not only flash flood, but tremendous uh, landslides. So I think this combination of models is going to help. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about that because the, there is a practical problem that at the very best, uh, people of northern India will get the eastern WF forecast, which is a 25 kilometer grid, and they're, they're, and, uh, which is probably not going to be enough to give you this, but what I, the question I would, would ask you to think about as you go away <laughs> is, is, um, uh, is it possible to, to bias correct uh, uh, and, and use the large scale models to be able to at least give an indication there before you go to a high resolution model? Because you're not always going to have the high resolution model sitting around waiting for one of these events to occur. So if the, if the, if the, if the big model gives you a hint, yeah. Yeah, and I think the hint, hints are going to be very clear. I mean, we, another thing we've done with the trim data are these, uh, you know, 14-year climatologies of the, of, the, of the trim radar echoes in that region. We know what's normal, and we, we've composited the, um, the uh, reanalysis data f for extreme convective events in different, different parts of the Him Himalayan region. We know what the normal uh, large-scale patterns are with those with those systems, and each of the each of these uh, flood systems that we've looked at, the Pakistan floods in 2010 and the Lay flood, the Pakistan flow is a different uh, low rise, a slow rise flood. But in both of these cases, um, the uh, the large scale flow was was vastly anomalous from what 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 is normal, and and from from some, I think with that armed with that knowledge. Um, you know the knowledge, the knowledge of an upcoming highly anomalous uh, large-scale flow pattern. The uh, the uh, regional models could be brought in yeah. to really focus on, on what might occur on the uh, on the smaller smaller scale. Yeah, these are important points because um, uh, one thing we do know for the 2010, 2000, 2012, where we're talking in 2010, was it how many people killed? Many thousands of people killed, billions of dollars worth of damage. Uh, uh, I could go on and on, but the, the, those three uh, t times that, that were extremely predictable in terms of the rainfall, and you put that to a hydrological model, you could do very well. And the flash flood has always been a more difficult one. And, yeah. I'm talking too much. Any questions? <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, so two questions. I'm sorry. Um, the, 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 question, the question is, are the number of these storms increasing or decreasing? Hmm. Yeah, the, the trim data set is 14 years in length, and I think that's marginal for being able to determine any, any trend. 
Um, that's why it's, I think it's important to keep these satellite measurements going now because there's no other way other than with the radars to really identify these, these specific types of, of extreme events. Yeah, he, he's asking if um, there's evidence from satellite data of the, um, of the triggering over the low orographic features. And the answer is yes in a sort of qualified way. The, the geosynchronous data have enough time resolution to see this. And, and uh, we see a lot of instances, for example, over that western Argentina area, we see many, many repetitions of this, of this triggering over, over, those, over those low hills. With the trim data, we don't have we don't have time continuity, but but we have a lot of statistics, and we see that these these uh, for example, I showed these these deep convective cores. We have other categories of extreme echoes. We we can see where the uh, see clearly the frequency of occurrence in relationship to topographical features, and these extremely deep, intense convective storms almost never occur over over higher terrain they're always they're always popping up over the showing up over these over these foothill regions so i'm fairly confident that we've got evidence to that effect although you have to take some interpretation well, i'd like to thank all the speakers and we have a don't go we have a second um, uh, session starting at 20 in 20 minutes time so let's thank the speakers